if you fall within that senior adult range, we would love to have you. We're going to have some great food and fellowship and social distancing. That will take place over by the activity center, like I said, under a tent. So we'd like to encourage you after that second service to stay for that senior adult luncheon. Also, I need you to mark your calendars, and that is because Saturday, September 26th, it is our annual craft fair that we will be having here at Burlington Baptist Church. Now, we have contacted the health department, and we um, have some guidelines that we need to follow, but we're going to be able to do it and follow um, our guidelines to have that. And this is such going to be an exciting day. I don't think there's going to be that many shows here in North Kentucky, so ours is going to be great, of course. But the $3 admission that goes goes towards sending children to camp. So I know we didn't get to go this year, or this year, but next year it's my goal that we can be able to give children even more money that make it a very affordable for them to attend camp. And I put it out there in the first, um, first service, and I said, you know what, let's just um, see if we can't send every child for free to camp. So we can do that if you all come and participate in our um, craft fair, so we'd love to uh, see you then. I don't think I talked about Eliza Broadus, did I? All right, that was a big thing on my number one list and probably already had the slide up there. I'm kind of trying to think about everything that I had to say this morning. But as Kentucky Baptists, this is the time of year that we set aside time to collect an offering. We saw a little video just before we started about Eliza Broadus, and all of those monies that is collected through that offering goes to support missions here in Kentucky. As we saw in the video, there's racetrack ministries, there are feeding the hungry, but it also goes toward our collegiate ministries and starting new churches. So every dollar is so important and given to Eliza brought us. Now we are a very large church and our goal is only 4,000. So I know that we can meet that goal and exceed that goal. So please considering over the next few Sundays to give to Eliza brought us. Well right now um, we've got another special announcement and Jeff Perry is going to come up here and fill you all in. Good morning Burlington Baptist Church. I got to say it this week. How awesome. Hey you will notice today that we have some beautiful flowers. This week, our church staff got to celebrate, and so many of you were so wonderful to send out wishes to our own Miss Bonnie, who is celebrating 40 years of service at Burlington Baptist Church. <laughs> Bonnie, you got to stand up. There she is back there. There's Bonnie. It didn't take me long, 21 years ago, when I walked in the door to figure out that when Bonnie leaves, I can leave. Um, I don't want to be around because she knows where everything is at. She knows how every family is connected. It is simply amazing. And whenever we have a question, hers is the uh, office that has the carpet worn out the most because we always run in there to find out what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. But we are so thankful because... 40 years is a long time, but the biggest thing that you have to understand that she is such a minister in her own right. Over these 40 years, I've watched her work through the food pantry, and we used to be back in the old office area, and she would get groceries for people that would walk in in need. She's taken, I can't tell you how many thousands of phone calls from people that might have been suffering and needing um, some help at that point in time. And just to have her direct those phone calls to the right people and sometimes in her own right be able to help those people out herself was just a blessing. And I know that she hasn't always been attending here over the years. A couple of years ago it was kind of hard because we'd talk about Bonnie and she wasn't here every week. We're so blessed that her and Greg now come and join us each Sunday and they're part of our worship time. But we just want to say thank you. Thank you, Greg, for letting her work for us, first of all, because that's a, a true blessing. And Bonnie, you know how much I love you, and you know how much the staff loves you, and we couldn't do this without you. And again, give her a big round of applause for that. So many of you have contributed this. This is a gift from personnel and from the church to Bonnie. Uh, just a little token of our appreciation for the time that she served. I know some of you have asked me this morning how you can give that. It's kind of funny because 
all the money goes through Bonnie. So, you know, we'll figure it out, but if you still want to contribute to it, uh, just a gift, we would greatly uh, uh, take that and just a token of your appreciation. We know how much we love her. So as we get ready for worship today, let's join for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're excited today. We're excited because we get to come into your house and just praise you. And Father, we know through all the chaos and all the craziness that's going on in this world, and it, it's changing every day. It just seems never to be stable. We just lean on you for understanding and to help us make the decisions that we need to make. And Father, we pray for our leaders, the people that are making decisions each day. Just let your hand guide them. And as only you can do, find a way to reach into their hearts and let them know of your presence. And Father, during this time, we know that there's a lot of people that are out there that are struggling, not just financially, but emotionally. They feel the disconnect of being around people. And as they go through this time of loneliness, Father, again, just make them aware of, uh, that there are people in this community that love them. And if we can be a beacon, if we can reach out to them, Father, just find a way to guide us to them. We thank you and celebrate the victories that we've had this week. We celebrate the victory that we had uh, with uh, just a surgery that was being done this week that was going to be immense. And we thank you for being with uh, our brother Clyde as he, he went through that. And now he begins the healing process. I'm touched every day, Father, because we have such a network of loving people in this church that are continually watching out for people. And we know that, know that you've blessed us with Bonnie to give us that basis, even in the office. So, Father, as we worship you today, take the praise that we're getting ready to sing from the top of our lungs as an offering to you. Bless the words that Harold's going to break and share with us. Just let them touch us in a special way. Help us as we plan to reach this community and to share Jesus in so many ways. We pray all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's stand up together, and uh, if you're a visitor, we want to welcome you and tell you thanks for choosing us this morning to worship with. Don't get out of your seats too much and whatever, but turn around and yell at somebody and tell them that you are happy to see them. Nothing is better than you. 
turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray over our offering this morning. Uh, we don't pass the offering plate, but you have the, the boxes that collect in the back. They're the dark ones. And then there's the dollar club box that's the clear ones out there. So and we've got lives of broadness going on. We've got all sorts of giving to do. So uh, let's, let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come into your house. Lord, I want to just thank you for all of these faces in here just together to worship. And we thank you for the ability to do that. And um, especially during this time, where we took it, we kind of took it for granted, and we got shown that this is just so awesome to just be able to get here together and sing. Lord, just be with Harold this morning as he brings the message, and, and just uh, give him the word that somebody needs to hear this morning. Bless this offering and those that give it, and help us to just use it to glorify your kingdom. I thank you again for Bonnie. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah In the presence of my enemy
Amen. You guys have a seat. Amen. Thank you, praise team, for that. And uh, man, got some guests this morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, thank you for joining us online. For those of you who are doing that, hey, Danny, would you grab that there for me? Will you bring that stand over? All right. We 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 get this mixed up a little bit sometimes, and I forgot to get a podium. And but anyway, thank you for joining us, Danny. Somebody said they came this morning and they said they knew you, and uh, that's like the third or fourth time that that's happened. And, I'm always amazed. I'm like, you still came? Danny's going to be gone this week, so you all pray for him. He's going out west to hunt some wild game, and uh, he's going to miss baby dedication next week. And uh, <clears throat> Anyway, uh, we're in a series. Uh, he, he loves baby dedication, and somehow it ended up why he was gone that it got scheduled. So anyway, uh, we're in a series called uh, You Can't Be Doing That. Preventing the Spread of Cultural Christianity. And uh, a good book that uh, kind of helps understand cultural Christianity is by Dean and Sir called The Unsaved Christian, uh, Reaching Cultural Christianity with the Gospel. And so we've been talking about cultural Christianity. I want to spend just a few moments uh, defining uh, cultural Christianity. Uh, cultural Christianity often believes that good people go to heaven, and most people categorize themselves as good people. So lots of people think they're going to heaven because they're a good person. Cultural Christianity is more about outward appearance. And so uh, doing good, coming to church, more important that's more important than a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, and so a cultural Christian might have a, bumper, a fish bumper sticker, and they'll show up on Sundays, uh, especially on Easter and Christmas. Cultural Christians uh, like to focus on passages about uh, loving everyone. And they often ignore passages about sin and repentance and the wrath and the judgment of God. Uh, when issues of culture conflict with the teachings of Scripture, cultural Christians usually rationalize and say things like, well, God's not that concerned about the specifics as long as you're a nice and loving person. Uh, cultural Christians don't want to make too much sacrifice or commitment to following Christ. They want to look like a Christian on Sunday, but they want to look like the world the rest of the week. And the, the biggest problem with cultural Christianity is that it is not biblical Christianity. And uh, the Bible says that we must be born again. And when we're born again, the, uh, the Bible says old, all things become new, old things pass away. Uh, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself and, and come after me. 
Uh, and so we don't follow Jesus on our own terms. And, uh, and so we, church, we've got to get the gospel right. Uh, people's eternity is at stake. And uh, I want you to hear this. Not everyone who admires Jesus is a follower of Jesus. And not everyone who is on our church membership rows are in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so we've got to make sure we get the gospel right. And so uh, this morning we're going to talk about something called moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic therapeutic deism. I'm going to define that in a few minutes and, and help you to understand it. But I want to invite you to turn to Matthew 19. And uh, we're going to look at verses 16 through 22. Uh, the rich young man who comes to Jesus. We're going to talk about that. I invite you to stand if you find your place. And uh, we'll honor God's word. And I also want to congratulate Bonnie for 40 years. And uh, she is as awesome as Jeff said she was. Uh, she is a blessing to work with each day, and I'm thankful for her. And y'all been blessed for 40 years with her, so amen to that. Uh, verse 16, Matthew 19, And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let's pray. Father, we come this morning. And uh, we need to hear from you. And uh, this passage is, is, is sharp. And uh, it's so important that we understand what Jesus says in regards to, to how we can have eternal life. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give us ears to hear and receptive hearts and remove any distractions so that we might hear from you. And uh, Lord, we, just, we also want to acknowledge how desperately we need you as a, as a country. We need you. There's so much... And chaos and division and, and uh, fear and, and uh, division. And so we pray for your healing. Uh, we pray for you, for you especially uh, to intervene in those who are dealing with this virus, bring healing. Lord, but more than anything, we need revival in our land. And I pray that it would start in our churches, start with me, start with uh, the folks here this morning ones listening. Lord, I pray that you would move in our hearts, steer our hearts back to you, uh, kindle the fire of our love and devotion to you, and uh, we pray that we would go and make much of Jesus and proclaim the gospel that people might be saved. And so may the gospel be clearly presented this morning, and we pray that some would be saved and follow Jesus. We pray for that, and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated this morning, and uh, so here's what we have. We have a, a young man, it says in verse 20, who comes to Jesus, and he comes with what I'd call a sincere request. What good deed, verse 16, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? Eternal life's talking about salvation. It's talking about going to, to heaven uh, in, in eternity. And so here's a man who comes to Jesus, and he wants to know what he must do to have eternal life. Again, what good thing or deed must I do? Now, from an evangelistic perspective, uh, man, here is a man who's ready to be saved. And uh, all Jesus has to do is kind of draw the net, if you will. And, uh, I mean, he doesn't have to convince him about the reality of God or, or the Bible, heaven, hell, judgment. Uh, and so we would say from a human perspective, this is a hot prospect. He is ripe for the harvest. He is eager, ready, and willing. And uh, as I study this passage, I... I I think, you know, uh, Jesus might have failed personal evangelism in our seminary classes. And you say, what do you mean he, he might have failed? Well, listen, he didn't seal the deal. He didn't get the decision. He didn't draw the net. And then I soberly realized that Jesus doesn't have to measure up to our standards of evangelism. Instead, uh, our evangelism should align with Jesus's. And sometimes there's a big difference. John MacArthur said, modern evangelism is preoccupied with decisions, statistics, 
aisle-walking, gimmicks, prefabricated presentations, pitches, emotional manipulation, and even intimidation. Unbelievers are told that if, you, if they invite Jesus into their hearts, accept him as personal Savior, or believe the facts of the gospel, that's all there is to do. The aftermath is appalling, as seen in the lives of millions who have professed faith in Christ with no consequent impact on their behavior. Who knows how many people are deluded into believing they are saved when they are not. And we saw this a few weeks ago in Matthew 7. Many come to Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, let me do all these things. And he says, depart from me. I, I never Listen, church, I want you to really get a hold of what Jesus is saying here. As we consider this inquiry from this rich young ruler, listen, he, I point out he come to the right source. He came to Jesus. John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so Jesus is the one who knows how to get to heaven. And so he came to the right person. Uh, and apparently this man had everything except eternal life. He had wealth, he had religion, and yet he seems to have no hope of eternity. He is missing eternal life. And so this rich young ruler comes to Jesus with a works-oriented mindset and says, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And so apparently he was raised or, or trained to think of religion as a system to earn divine favor with God. And today there are so many people who think that they can earn their way to heaven by being a good person. And so moralistic therapeutic deism, I, I, I just want to kind of define that. Moralistic has to do with morals. So it says that we should be good moral people. It doesn't say we should be born again followers of Jesus, just, just that we should be good people. The therapeutic part says that God wants us to be happy and, and well-adjusted. God wants us to, uh, to feel good about ourselves and to have high self-esteem. Now, the, the deism part just says that there's a God, and, and He made the world, and after He made it, He kind of left it alone, and He's not personally involved in the everyday lives of people. And so, if you hear this moralistic therapeutic deism, there's some books about it, and especially our young people are often kind of led in this direction. But here's five points, if you, if you want specifics, five tenets of moralistic therapeutic deism. First, a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. That's the, the deistic part. And we, we would agree with that. The second is God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and in most other religions. Now that's the moralistic part. Number three, the central go of life is to be happy and feel good about oneself. That's the therapeutic part. God wants us to, to be happy. Number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. And so, in other words, there's a God who created us, but we only have to go to Him when we really get in a mess. And number five, and maybe the central tenet of of moralistic therapeutic deism is that good people go to heaven when they die. Now, church, you, you heard those five, and while some of those things might seem sound reasonable, that's not the kind of Christianity that we're taught in the Bible. Christ did not die so that we would be good and well-adjusted people. Well, somebody should have said amen to that. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to rescue us from the curse of sin, well-behaved people is not his go. He wants us to be redeemed and our sins forgiven. And, but here's what happens. Young people come into our churches and we teach them morality. And we convey a message that implies that good people go to heaven. And when we do that, we minimize the most important thing. The most important thing is that they need Jesus. We can't be good enough. We need Jesus to save us. And so you, you say, well, preacher, why are you using big and confusing words like moralistic? Ther Listen, some of you are first time here. I don't normally, you all know me. I don't even know big words. And so that's not normal. Uh, but, it, but moralistic therapeutic deism, it is counter to the gospel in so many ways. We are not saved by being good or by working our way up some type of good works ladder. God is not some type of divine genie who's dispensing wishes at our command. 
He's also not like a, a divine clockmaker who's set everything in motion and who just sits back and watches to see how things are going to play out. That, that's not the God, the, the God of the Bible. Listen here, the gospel tells us that Jesus has accomplished for us through his sinless life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection from the grave, Jesus has accomplished for us everything that we need for eternal life. Everything. He didn't leave anything out. And that availability is to all who will come in faith and believe in Jesus Christ. I mean, last week we observed the Lord's Supper, and we were just reminded that Jesus gave his life. He hung on the cross. He shed his blood so that we could have the forgiveness of our sins. And so verse 17, and Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is no one who is good. Only God is good. And listen, Jesus was God. Jesus was sinless. And this rich young ruler doesn't seem to understand exactly who Jesus is. I mean, he wants to know what he must do instead of realizing that he has to come to Jesus. Now, back to this young man's question in verse 16. What good deed must I do? Well, in response to this sensible request, Jesus gives a straightforward reply. Verse 17, if you would enter life or if you want eternal life, keep the commandments. Now you hear that and you say, wait just a minute, preacher. Every week you stand up there and you say that we're saved by faith alone and Jesus Christ alone, not in keeping the law or not in keeping the commandments. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, not by our good stuff, uh, but according to his mercy he has saved us. Yes, yes, yes. But the question that was asked is, what must I do to have eternal life? There is an answer to that question. Jesus gave the answer in Matthew 5, 48. Be ye therefore perfect, as my Father in heaven is perfect. If you want to earn your way to heaven, you have to be perfect. And we know that none of us are anywhere close to perfect. Only Jesus was perfect and sinless and spotless. And so what Jesus said was truth. The problem is no one keeps the commandments. James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point, I mean, I dare say all of us has already failed at one point today. Whoever keeps the whole law and fails at one point has been accountable, become accountable for all of it or is guilty of all of it. Now, obedience to God's command is important, but it will never save us. And so this young man hears this and he wants to clarify a little bit. Verse 18, he says, which ones? I can have eternal life if I keep the commandments. Which ones, Jesus? And so Jesus shares some of the commandments, verse 18. Uh, and these are commandments in regards to human relationships. Uh, you shall not murder. That's the sixth commandment. You shall not commit adultery. That's the seventh commandment. You shall not uh, steal. That's the eighth. You shall not bear false witness. That's the ninth. Verse 19, honor your father and mother. That's the fifth commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's a summary command that Jesus had given. And so Jesus mentions some of the commandments, and in response, verse 20, we see a self-righteous response. Here's what the young man said. He said, all of these I have kept. You know, Jesus didn't say, thou shalt not lie, because uh, he just broke that one. But here's what he said. He said, all these I have kept, what, what do I still lack? And, and so this young man seems to have a sincere righteousness. And the religious establishment in the day, they prided themselves in keeping the commandments. Uh, but we know that Jesus' standard is, is so much higher. We know that God's concerned about our heart in the Sermon on the Mount in uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 21. You shall, you've heard it said, you shall not murder. Uh, but verse 22, I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother is guilty of murder. Uh, verse 27, you shall not commit adultery. You've heard that commandment. But I say to you, anyone who has lustful intent is guilty of that. And, and so we can walk down through the commandments. But again, God is concerned about what's in our heart, even if it doesn't necessarily come out in our actions and our deeds. Jeremiah said that the heart is deceitful above all and desperately wicked. And so uh, this man, this young man had a major problem. And his problem was self-righteousness, and he couldn't, or at least he wouldn't admit that he was a sinner. And Jesus has already said, no one's good, only God. 
And so this young man has no sense of his own sinfulness and his rebellion against God. Listen, folks, there can be no salvation when there's no recognition of sin. That's why when we come to the book of Romans, it's, it's about theology and it's about God's salvation. But the first three chapters is all about the sinfulness of humanity. The fact that we're sinners. The fact that no one's good. No, not one. No one seeks God. No, no one. It's, Paul wants to lay that out first for us to understand our, our, the sinfulness of humanity. So there's, you know, there's no need of a Savior if you don't know you're a sinner. And so part of the gospel must be us helping man to see his sinfulness and realizing that sin's a really big deal because God is completely holy and he's not going to allow sin into heaven and we're sinners and our sin separates us from God. That's why we've got to help people to understand that when we share the gospel. Uh, when we share the gospel, we've got to tell people that God hates sin and God punishes sin. Psalm seven eleven. God is a righteous judge. God is angry with the wicked every day. I'm not, I said it earlier, I'm not sure it's appropriate to tell someone who's on the way to hell that God has a wonderful plan for their life. This man was a genuinely religious man. And listen, Jesus loved him. Jesus was about to go to the cross and die for him. The Bible says that God is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any would perish, but all come to repentance. And so he loved this man. But this young man was not only self-righteous, but he was surely self-deceived. And Jesus wanted to help him to see his true heart. And so he asks, what do I, what do I still lack? And Jesus responds in verse 21 with a startling requirement. You all ready for this? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect or complete, or if you, basically if you want salvation, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor. Now the 10th commandment is in regards to coveting. And Jesus knew this man's heart. And he knew how important his possessions were for him. And so he says, listen, here's what you need to do. You need to go sell what you got and give it to the poor. And Can, can you imagine how startled this man was when he heard those words? Go and sell what I got and give to the poor. And listen, church, Jesus is not teaching salvation by philanthropy, giving away everything. But what he does demand is our primary allegiance. And so we talk about repentance and faith, and repentance is, is turning away. It's turning away from anything that we may be trusting in or depending on, and it's also turning from anything that we love or desire more than God. You know, sometimes we act like the gospel is simple as saying a prayer and leaving the same way you came. That's not from the Scriptures. No, there must be a willingness to forsake our sins and ourself and follow Christ at all cost. Matthew 10, 38. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. I mean, this is throughout the Gospels. So I, I don't, I, there's not just one place to look at. Look at Matthew 16. Matthew 16, 24. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? For what shall a man give in return for his soul? And we talked about this last week. It costs something to be a Christ follower. And Jesus says, count the cost. So often, I think we fail to articulate the cost of following Jesus. And over the years, I've had some discussions or maybe arguments or, or with people who, in regards to the need of repentance for salvation. And, and some people say, well, I think that comes later. I, I don't think that's... Well, the Bible says repent and believe. Repent and believe. And I just don't believe you can stay in your sins and follow Christ. I don't believe that you can stay in love with your idols and follow Jesus. Now, folks, I'm not a radical fundamentalist because I think Christ ought to be more important than our sinful desires. 
But here's this. I understand. Listen, this, this morning it seemed like, as I looked over my notes, it seemed like that I had to wrestle with God a little bit because we all have certain sinful desires and, and we want to hold on to them. And we come to a passage like this and we're like, well, oh, Jesus, I don't, you know, I don't, if Jesus hadn't been the one that said this, I don't know if I'd want to preach it. But he's the one who said it. And so it is sharp, and we have to wrestle with it. And, and uh, Henry Blackaby says, you can't stay where you are and go with God. And so we have these accounts in Matthew chapter 4 of Peter and Andrew. They're, they're fishermen, and they're, that's their business. And, and Jesus comes by, and he's, he invites them to come and, and follow him. Uh, verse 20 uh, of, of Matthew 4, immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going from there, they came to, to James and, and John, his brother, and they were mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left their boat and, the, and their, follow, their father, and they followed him. And last week we were in Matthew 9.9, 9, and Jesus goes to the tax collector's booth, and Matthew was there, and Jesus said, follow me. And it says immediately he arose and followed, and, and they couldn't stay where they were at and go with Jesus. And so here's a question for us this morning. Well, what have you left to follow Jesus? And I don't know if a lot of us would have to say, well, I haven't left hardly anything. It's not really cost me anything. What, what have you given up to follow Jesus? I mean, look at the person beside you and, and say, what have you left to follow Jesus? Now, s some people, again, I, I wrestled with God this morning about this. I'm like, I, 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 I'm, I'm on grace, man. I want to really... And some people, you're thinking, that sounds a little too radical. But that's what the young ruler thought. I mean, when he heard those words, he thought, wait just a minute. And so, verse 22, notice this solemn reaction. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. It sounded like his possessions owned him instead of him owning them. And Jesus knew the condition of his heart. He, he knows our heart as well. This young man, he didn't come to Jesus humbly and willing to do and give whatever Jesus asked. Listen, his possessions were too much to give up. Now listen, I've never heard of anybody give up anything for the sake of following Jesus and come back to me and say, Preacher, I regret I ever did that. I bet you haven't either. I'd be surprised if anybody ever gave up and said, I, 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 didn't, I wish I'd never given that up to follow Jesus. David Livingston was a medical missionary to Africa, and he wrote about the, the high honor of, of serving Jesus. He said, forbid that we should ever consider the holding of a commission from the king of kings a sacrifice. I'm a missionary, heart and soul. God himself had an only son, and he was a missionary and a physician. A poor, poor imitation I am and wish to be. But in this service, I hope to live. In it, I wish to die. I still prefer poverty and mission service to riches and ease. This is my choice. Jim Elliott, many of you have probably read his testimony. He was the, the missionary to the Chikawa Indians in South America. And, and he was, at a young age, he was willing to give up his earthly things for heavenly rewards. There's a quote we often uh, share from him. He Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And we know that he lost his earthly life at a, at a young age. He lost his earthly life to spread the gospel to these natives, but he didn't lose his eternal reward. And so I just I want to deal with this passage as, as honestly as I can. Do, do we have to sell everything to follow Jesus? Not necessarily. I mean, there are rich believers in the Bible who use those riches for, for kingdom purposes. And so, preacher, what do we have to do to follow Jesus? Well, first of all, we have to recognize our sinfulness. we got to understand we stand condemned by the law. We're not justified by the law. We look to the law and we realize we can't keep the law. We need a Savior. We have to recognize our sinfulness. And number two, we must disavow anything that would keep us from following Jesus. For this particular man, it was his money. For you and I, it could be something different. But be assured of this, God knows what it is. You keep reading verse 23. 
says, and Jesus said to his disciples, this is right after he went away sad, the, the rich young man, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 6, 24, says no one can serve two masters who either hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the others. You cannot serve God and money. And so, church, listen, this is where the rubber hits the road this morning. The driving force of our age is money, the pursuit of money, the love of money, of riches and stuff. And we live in the richest time in the history of the world. And Jesus says in verse 24, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus goes on. When his disciples heard this in verse 25, they were astonished. Who can be saved? Verse 26, Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Listen, the difficult, the difficulty for a sinner to enter heaven, it's impossible without a radical change of heart. But with God all things are possible. Aren't you glad that all things are possible? Our only hope is God's grace. And the good news is He extends His grace to us. And and so as we prepare to close this morning, are are you willing to surrender your life to the Lordship of Christ? And again, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, do do we literally have to give up everything to become a Christian? No, but... We must make Christ, we must give Christ first place and be willing to forsake all for Him. And we, listen church, we cannot follow Christ when our hands are so full of all the stuff of this world. That's the warning that Jesus wants us to hear this morning. I mean, so verse 16, what must I do to have eternal life? That, that's, the, that's such an important question. And the answer is really in verse 21, when Jesus says, come and follow me. But notice, we don't follow Jesus on our terms. It has to be on his terms. And verse 22 is so sad. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He he wanted eternal life. He wanted to be saved, but he wasn't willing to surrender to Jesus' lordship. Now, we can contrast that with uh, another man in the Bible, Zacchaeus. You know that wee little man? That wee little man, was he? He went up in the sycamore tree? Yeah. Y'all know that story? Jesus was coming by, and he wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to hear Jesus. Listen, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, just like Matthew last week. He was a rich man. And when Jesus came and preached and went to him, Zacchaeus was filled with sorrow for his sins. It's a big difference than this guy in, in chapter 19. He came to a place where he was willing to do anything to come to Jesus. And so in Luke 19, verse 8, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. In other words, what he says is, Jesus, I don't want anything to get in my way of following you. I don't want anything to get in the way. And verse 9 says, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. You see, Zacchaeus put his faith into action. Nothing was held back. And so here's what I need to ask you this morning, church. Individually, really. Have you come to Jesus on your terms or on his? Have you given him his rightful place in your life? That's first place. Have you surrendered to his lordship? This morning, I, I want to invite you to respond to Jesus' gospel, not man's version, not man's watered-down version of the gospel. I want to invite you this morning to respond to Jesus'. And before you respond, I, Jesus said, count the cost. Are you willing to take up your cross and follow him? I want to tell you the good news is this morning, he gives grace. He gives grace to do the impossible. He's willing to change our hearts. Some of us are thinking, oh, I could never give up my possessions. You could with His grace. 
this morning, some of you hear those words of Jesus, come follow me, and you get to decide, is he worth it? Let's pray. Father, we come this morning, and your word is so sharp. We want eternal life. Lord, we know that this life is fleeting, we're, but a vapor, it's here for a little while, and then life vanishes away, and one day we're going to stand at the judgment, and we want eternal life. And yet so often we love the things of this world and we want both. And yet Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you've got to give up some things. Father, I pray today that we might understand that anything that you call us to give up is nothing in comparison to what we get when we have Jesus. And so I pray this morning, there might be some this morning who will count the cost and say, Jesus is worth it. He's worth it in my life, whatever he may want me to give up, wherever he might want me to go or do. He's worth it. I pray some this morning would hear your call to come and follow you. I I pray that some would respond in faith this morning. Do that, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand this morning and listen, this is your turn. Verse 22, that, that young man went away sorrowful. Listen, I don't don't want anybody to leave here this morning sorrowful. You don't have to. You can come and follow Jesus. Count the cost. I promise you it's worth it. Whatever he puts his finger on, it's worth it. But you get to decide, will you leave sorrowful or will you leave as a follower of Jesus Christ? Will you have the, the hope of eternity through faith in Jesus Christ? I'll be down front. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a a follower of Jesus. You decide though. Jesus says, come and follow me. Will you? Will you come and follow today? Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I found my rest. And without you, I fall. my soul to rise to you, when temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you, Jesus, you're my hope and stay, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you.
Amen. Amen. So good to see you this morning. I, I just want to share something for just a moment. You know, I just, we sing, Lord, I need you. And uh, I look out there this morning and I see lots of people and it, it, it makes us feel good, this people to sing. And, and yet my heart just kind of wonders if, if we are so looking forward to getting back to normal that we've maybe stopped asking God, what are you trying to teach us through all this? And uh, I think maybe God's trying to get our attention a little bit, individually and as a church. Listen, our, our land needs the Lord. And there is a period where people are a little more receptive. And, and yet we, we, we get so centered on getting back to normal. And, and then we get centered into the politics and the arguing. And listen, people need the Lord. And uh, may, maybe the... The worst thing that God could do is get this over with too quick, and we've not learned, and we've not turned to Him. And so, church, let's let's go out there and be the church and give people the true gospel. And I, I mentioned earlier, you know, we're we're Labor Day, and people do some things on Labor Day, but it's time to get back into worshiping the Lord and being the church. And uh, we got some people that need to get back to church. Now, I'm not talking about our vulnerable people. There there's some people that need to be away. Uh, our older people for sure and our vulnerable, but we got some younger people that should be back and we got classes for the kids. And so look around and, and make some contacts and encourage some people. And uh, I said it earlier and I, I wasn't going to say it again just because I know how some of you take it. But if you, if you hate mask more than you love Jesus, then you ought to ask yourself, is Jesus Lord? Because he's more important than something we might have to do. Okay. And so let's get serious about him and getting the gospel out there, and let's encourage one another with that, but let's not miss what God's been trying to do. Amen? And so let's go out there with the gospel this week, and Brother Ken's going to come and, and share an announcement. I just will mention uh, there's a prayer guide for missions, Liza brought us offering there out there on the table, and these uh, envelopes, I can't hold on to these this morning, but uh, envelopes are out there as well. Uh, please give to that this month. There's a lot going on in Kentucky, and uh, we want Kentucky to be reached with the gospel, and so give to that. And Ken, if you'll close with us, that would be awesome. I promise you that the pastor did not call me this morning, and I didn't call him about what we were wearing today. And <laughs> <laughs> hey, I uh, just want to let you guys know, a few weeks ago we had a... Uh, Pray, uh, pray for our protectors event where we went to the sheriff's department and uh, we spent some time there. It was, it, was, it was a great event. A lot of people showed up. Well, pastoral care has kind of piggybacked off of that and they've come up with a plan that they want to do and it's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome thing. Next Friday, September 11th at 10 a.m. over at the activity center, they're baking brownies and they need your help. So they're going to bake brownies. They're going to put together gift packs for the sheriffs, each and every one of them. So they're doing like 130 of them. And they're going to uh, personalize each one. They're going to put gift cards in there. They're going to put a scripture in there. And they need help baking, packing, and delivering. So next Friday, September 11th at 10 a.m. Activity Center, they can sure use your help. And uh, they would appreciate you all coming out. Um, that and then finally the Dollar Club box is out there, a ministry that's near and dear to my heart. If you got a dollar, please, if you uh, feel so led. Um, it sure does a lot of great work in our community. So with that, let me close this with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our church. We thank you for our pastor, and we thank you for our staff and all the musicians behind us. And we, we appreciate this opportunity that we have where we can come into your house and freely worship you. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for our country. And just, just put your hand on our country and, uh, and lead us and, and let us be the lead, help us to be the leaders that we're supposed to be. Watch over us and keep us. Thank you for your son. Thank you for salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.